Welcome to the Spark Live webinar series, one component of our Spark Knowledge Mobilization Program. Spark is Children's Healthcare Canada's shared platform for advocacy, research, and knowledge. Spark Live is where we gather each week to curate, convene, and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community. Our goal is to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank our funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities, including this Spark Live bi-weekly webinar series. There are two options to join in on the live conversation. Questions and comments for our panel or presenters can be typed into the question box, or comments that you want to share with the audience can be typed into the chat box visible to all of our attendees. For those of you on Twitter, tag at ChildHealthCan on any webinar-related tweets or use the hashtag SparkLive. And to keep up to date on all of Children's Healthcare Canada's webinars and other activities, be sure to sign up for our weekly Spark News e-bulletin by visiting our website at childhealthcan.ca. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Paula Robson, your host for the next hour. I'll begin by acknowledging that Children's Healthcare Canada operates on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to Ottawa. Today, Ottawa is home to Indigenous peoples from all across Turtle Island. Children's Healthcare Canada is committed to working toward forging new and deepening existing relationships that include First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and is grateful for the opportunity to share this land as we work to measurably improve children's health outcomes from coast to coast to coast. We're delighted to speak today with colleagues from Ch the Childbright Network, Annette Mainmuir, uh, Darcy Failings, uh, Jessica Hansen, Sophie Lam Damji, and Tatiana Orgostova to bring you Navigating Edit CP or Early Detection and Intervention Toolkit for Cerebral Palsy for primary care physicians, rehabilitation specialists, and caregivers. And I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Annette is a senior scientist at the Research Institute of McGill University Health Center and a professor at the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy at McGill University. She currently leads Childbright, a pan-Canadian patient-oriented research network or SPORE network focused on children with brain-based disabilities. Tatiana is assistant professor at the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy at McGill University and a site researcher in pediatrics at the Research Center of the Jewish Rehabilitation Hospital. Darcy is a developmental pediatrician and professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. She is a senior clinician scientist in the Blurview Research Institute at Hall and Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. Jessica is a second year master's student in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill University. She's an investigator and collaborator on ongoing research initiatives at Kids Brain Health Network and the Childbright Network. Sophie is an occupational therapist at Hall and Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital who is interested in impacting clinical practice to improve access to evidence-based in interventions for kids with cerebral palsy. And in the interest of time, we'll now get right to the presentation. A full bio of our full speaker bios can be found on our website, and we'll drop a chat in uh, link in the chat to those. Welcome all. It's now my pleasure to pass the mic to Tatiana. Right. Everybody can hear me well and see the presentation. Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. All right, so welcome everybody. We're really excited and happy to be here with you today to talk about uh, ERIT-CP, so Early Detection and Intervention Toolkit for Cerebral Palsy. So to start with, um, cerebral palsy, as we know, is the most common uh, childhood physical disability worldwide. And we also know that a late diagnosis of cerebral palsy leads to delays in receiving the much needed and essential interventions for cerebral palsy. 
Uh, early detection and evidence-based interventions are really key for children and their families to improve their health outcome. However, we also know that there's a really long gap uh, of about 17 years uh, between the research findings and the actual implementation of those practices in clinical settings. So there's a, really a need for a comprehensive knowledge translation or KT strategy to optimize the use of evidence-based detection and interventions in the field of cerebral palsy. So we address that need by creating a DCP and putting it in place. It's an online toolkit and it aims to provide evidence-based and user-friendly tools to support and to optimize CP detection intervention and also to empower patients and families with knowledge. So ADCP is hosted on the childhooddisability.ca slash ADCP toolkit. And as you can see, this is the main page of uh, the KT toolkit, and it's separated in two main components, the early detection component and the early intervention component. So in today's webinar, we're going to talk about those components. So first, we have Dr. Darcy Fellings, who will be introducing the early detection section for the neonatal follow-up programs. So this is really uh, for those kids who are more at risk of a higher risk for developing CP. So maybe they've had a complicated uh, pregnancy, compl uh, complications during birth or in the postnatal period, and they were followed uh, by the neonatal follow-up programs. So this is to uh, for those programs to use the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination or the HINE in order to really promote early detection of cerebral palsy. We also have Dr. Annette Meimer, who, who will be talking about early detection more for community-based physicians and families. So this is really uh, for the majority of kids who actually have milder forms of CP, so they didn't have a complicated uh, pregnancy, a complicated birth or postnatal period, and are followed in the community by primary care physicians as uh, part of the regular follow-up. And uh, this particular section of ADCP is to expedite referral processes for the early diagnosis of cerebral palsy. We then have uh, the occupational therapist, uh, Sophie, talking about baby constraint uh, induced movement therapy or baby CIMT, which is one of the very effective interventions for cerebral palsy. And myself and Jessica will be talking about other interventions for young children with CP age zero to five. So now we're on to Darcy, uh, Darcy Fellings, who uh, will be presenting a video about the Hein, and she will be present during the discussion at the end of this webinar. Hi, my name is Darcy Fellings. I'm a developmental pediatrician, and I'm here to tell you about the early detection CP at its CP toolkit and focusing on the Hammersmith Infant Neurologic Examination. So this project is a project that was developed by uh, many developmental pediatricians, neonatologists, therapists, uh, both physical therapists and occupational therapists. And we were working in partnership with many of the tertiary and quaternary neonatal follow-up clinics across Canada to embed the Hammersmith tool into their practice. So let me give you a little bit of background. The average age of diagnosis for cerebral palsy is close to 19 months in Canada. And this actually represents a late diagnosis. We have a new international clinical practice guideline that tells us that we can identify and detect CP as early as five months of age, particularly in children with known uh, factors that increase their chance of developing cerebral palsy. For example, children in neonatal follow-up clinics and the Hammersmith is a key tool for this early detection. Now, why is early detection important? It's important because it allows us to make early referrals to evidence-based interventions. And we know the earlier that the children start working with uh, therapists that support early interventions, it helps to maximize their impact. So let me tell you a little bit about the Hammersmith. It's a great standardized neurologic examination. It's for infants between 3 and 24 months corrected age. And you can download a free scoring sheet here that has 26 items. And these are just examples of two items. And you can see that 
within each item, you can get a score. So one of the huge positive aspects of the Heim is that it's a scorable tool. So why is it great? Easy to perform, you can embed it into clinical practice, it takes about five to 10 minutes to administer. It can help to improve your neurologic examination skills. Even inexperienced staff can learn how to perform it and the reliability is high. We have high 10th percentile score information. Well, what does that mean? It means that we know where children should generally be falling. And so if you have a child who's at above or below that 10th percentile score, it gives you information on where that child is standing in terms of his neurologic or her neurologic performance. Importantly, it gives you asymmetry scores and it's very sensitive therefore for picking up hemiplegic cerebral palsy, which is our most common subtype of cerebral palsy. We see it in close to 40% of children. It's inexpensive and importantly, you can follow children with sequential exams so you can see how they're doing. So how have we supported introducing the HIND? Uh, we uh, started doing this project during the pandemic, and so we did a lot of uh, information sharing through webinars. And in the Edit CP Toolkit, we have our introductory webinar embedded, as well as a handout. It gives you some really good basic information on the HIND. And then importantly, we heard from our neonatal follow-up colleagues that the differential scoring according to the age of the child was a potential barrier for using the HIND. So we developed a HIND scoring aid, which is also embedded in the Edit CP Toolkit. And this is now published in Development of Medicine Child Neurology and was done in partnership with international leaders in the HIND. For example, Lena Hatcha, Francis Cohen, Domenico Romeo, Joanne George, Bridget Palmer. So why is the scoring aid helpful? We can put information, clinical information on the child that you're doing the HIND on. We, in one page, put five or six key bullets of information on helping you to interpret the score. We've also given you lots of information on reference scores from many different papers. And then the bottom part of the scoring aid has a graph where you can plot the children according to um, their score and over time. So in summary, that is a quick overview of the HIND in the Edit CP Toolkit. And I am going to turn it over to the other presenters to tell you more about the Edit CP Toolkit. Thank you. All right, thank you, Darcy. Um, so before passing on the microphone to Dr. Annette Meimer, I'm going to show you how to get uh, to the early detection piece for community-based physicians on the site. So again, if we go on the main page of ADCP uh, through the childhooddisability.ca slash ADCP toolkit, uh, we're seeing again those two uh, big sections and we just need to click on this link uh, that you see here. So now what you can see is different uh, signs and symptoms of typical versus atypical development. And Annette will be talking to you a little bit more about what those are. We also have warning signs and referral recommendations. Um, this, uh, those signs could be printed uh, in form of a poster. So something that you can print and uh, have it uh, to distribute in your clinic or even post it on the walls. So uh, off to Annette uh, to talk about the development of those uh, particular signs and symptoms. Thanks, Tatiana. So um, as you know, internationally, there's been a primary focus on early identification of young children with cerebral palsy with a major focus on high-risk newborns who are NICU graduates and are part of neonatal follow-up programs. And in their monitoring um, standardized assessments, such as the Hammersmith or Hine, um, are, can be used for early detection of cerebral palsy, which uh, Darcy focused on and is part of the toolkit. Um, so, however, we know that about half of children with CP have uneventful pregnancies and deliveries, and therefore it is really the primary care providers 
who are in the position to detect signs of CP early and refer to medical specialists for diagnosis and to rehabilitation specialists for intervention. So the PROMPT study aimed to develop tools that could be used by primary care providers for early detection. In this, um, in this uh, study, which helped us to develop the tools, we first looked at an environmental scan of current practices across Canada and noted that diagnosis of CP is quite late, close to 19 months of age with a wide variability uh, and much later from primary care providers. We also did a scoping review to see if there are any validated signs of CP that would be appropriate for the primary care context, which there were not. So then we decided to develop tools that could be used by primary care providers. And we used consensus methodology to identify key attributes of CP that could be detected in the context of well baby care. We also validated these attributes by conducting an international Delphi survey uh, to be sure that experts agreed that these each of these attributes, any one of them, would be a sign of CP or other neur neuromotor impairment. Finally, in creating the tools for the Edit CP Toolkit, we worked together with primary care providers and parents of young children with CP. I just want to acknowledge uh, Zach Boychuk, who did much of this work as part of his doctoral thesis. So, uh, so as Tatiana mentioned, we have this in our uh, toolkit and there is a poster that can be um, downloaded and used in, in clinic or in the community. It has six different attributes, any of which should be prompt a referral for diagnosis of CP. So for example, in the first one, the child consistently demonstrates a hand preference before 12 months of age. So we see what is expected, that a child will use the closest hand to reach for a toy, but what is a concern is if they use the sa same hand, irrespective of where the um, toy is placed. So there are other signs like this in terms of tightness or fist, fisting, um, persistent head lag, and so forth. So I urge you to, to look at this um, on our website. There are also warning signs that should not prompt immediate referral, but rather uh, should prompt careful monitoring of the child to look for these other signs. There is also consensus with international validation on referral recommendations. So when the child is being referred to a medical specialist for diagnosis, they should also be uh, referred to, to appropriate specialists for interventions as, uh, as with the referral recommendations. Finally, an implementation study is well underway in disseminating and promoting uptake of these tools for primary care providers and families. Uh, we have sought input from uh, these interested parties to enhance usability and feasibility of the tool. We also have conducted a variety of dissemination strategies and two to highlight is the Rourke Baby Record, which is used across Canada by primary care providers. It has a checklist of what to expect at each stage of development month by month. And we have embedded these attributes in the context of this uh, Rourke baby record. In Quebec, there is the Abecedaire, which is used uh, across the province of Quebec. And we are now finalizing full integration of these attributes. All right, thank you so much, Annette. And we're off to Sophie to talk about baby constraint induced movement therapy. So just to remind you how to get uh, to this particular section. So where you see early interventions, there is the baby CIMT section, and this takes you to the whole and blur view uh, resources. And those will be introduced uh, by Sophie. Thank you, Tatiana, for that warm introduction. So early evidence-based um, specific motor interventions harnesses the neuroplasticity of the developing brain. 
And we know early intervention is important because it helps to optimize and steer motor and functional outcomes. And as such, it's very important to build capacity for these early interventions. So what is the evidence for treatments for children with cerebral palsy? Well, Novak and her team um, collated the research evidence for over hundreds of therapy treatments for children with cerebral palsy. And using the traffic light system, um, she coded uh, those effective treatments with strong evidence in green. We see right away for children with unilateral or hemiplegic cerebral palsy to impact motor skills, CIMT, constraint induced movement therapy and or by manual therapy are effective treatments. We also know that effective treatments include coaching and training of parents, um, distributed active motor practice in the child's natural environment and setting um, parental goals for treatments to be effective. Next slide. So for children with hemiplegic cerebral palsy or infants who have high probability of cerebral palsy being the most common subtype, those children have early disuse of that arm and hand on the affected side. Baby constraint induced movement therapy is an early motor activity based intervention that involves blocking of the unaffected or stronger hand. It's paired with repeated structured motor practice of the um, weaker hand. The goal is to improve early on self-initiated active motor movements in the affected arm and hand, or what we call the helper hand. The repeated motor practice, um, how that is delivered is uh, the parents are coached and trained on how to play with the baby in an intentional way to provoke early movements and develop so those helper hand skills. The parents are playing with the babies anyway. We're just trying to teach the parents to play with the baby more intentionally and in a different sort of way. The parents are taught to play with the baby for 30 minutes per day, um, implementing this program into their natural baby's day um, for two six weeks periods. And in between the two six-week periods, the parents are then taught how to do some bimanual therapy. So um, how do we use toys to then um, integrate those unilateral hand skills that the baby learned during the, the periods of baby constraint-induced movement therapy so that the baby can then start to use both hands together? Next slide. So embedded in the Edit CP Toolkit, um, you'll be linked to the Holland Blurby website with these resources that Tatiana spoke about. There's a lot of user-friendly resources for clinicians, for practitioners, for families. Um, we have a video on how to develop and implement baby constraint induced movement therapy. We have lots of infographics on how to get started. Um, we're actually in the process of developing some short videos to really isolate and tease out, you know, how do we position baby? How do we position the caregiver? What toys to choose, what are the helper hand skills that would be provoked if I used a certain toy. Um, right now, we're actively pushing out to the finish line a baby CIMT handbook that we hope to launch by early fall. And what's really exciting about this baby CIMT handbook is that there's a shopping cart feature. So it will enable the clinician to really go in and develop a just right customizable baby CIMT program really easily. Because we know one of the barriers is not having the resources at hand and really having to spend a lot of time to develop um, you know, programs that we're unfamiliar with. So this will enable the clinician to quickly go in and select the helper hand skill that they wanna work on, the level of difficulty, whether depending on where the baby is starting at and how to progress um, the helper hand skills. It also enables the clinician to filter through activities and toys that um, may be common in the home or if parents are looking for suggestions to purchase anything. Next slide. So I've talked a lot about baby constraint induced movement therapy, but what do parents and clinicians think about it? We've heard time and time again that parents felt that if this was a program that was um, available earlier on, um, it would have been great. So this is coming from a parent whose uh, baby entered our baby CIMT program at 14 months of age. We've heard from parents that um, having access to a clinician, um, being able to be coached on what to do, what to expect, how to implement it, am I on the right track? Um, it makes baby CIMT more feasible to implement in the home. And they have found that there have been some effective outcomes. We've also heard from clinicians that it's easier to implement baby constraint induced movement therapy early on and they have seen some very early positive results. So thank you everybody. I'm going to pass it back to Tatiana. All right. Thank you so much, Sophie. So now uh, we're going to show you myself and Jessica the early intervention um, uh, side uh, of the toolkit. All right. So if again, we're back to the main page, you're going to see a lot of the main page today in this webinar and we go on the section 
on early interventions now. So what you're going to see once you click on the link is um, a short introduction. So in, in here, we're um, referring to clinicians and families about what to expect in this particular, uh, particular section. And then you see all the different interventions for which there is evidence out there that were included uh, in, in this section. So for instance, we have acupuncture, the COPCA program, deep friction massage, early vibration therapy, CIMT, we have the electrical stimulation, the habit program, which is the hand arm by manual intensive training, um, different interventions related to nutrition and feeding rehab, uh, oral sensory motor intervention, and so on. So another feature that you could see is that below each intervention, uh, we see a uh, what CP type is it for, the CP severity for which there's evidence, the actual evidence level that was determined by really critically appraising every single randomized clinical trial that went into those modules, as well as the effectiveness level. So whether this intervention was more or as effective as the comparison intervention. So let's say if we select one of those, let's say the COPCA program, we have a little introduction along with a few resources, um, for example, about training uh, on using this program. And this is followed by the parent and family information section. It is designed in form of typical questions and answers um, that parents may have. So for instance, what is this program? Who provides it? What to expect? Is it right for my child? And uh, this is followed by the clinician information section. So it's a lot more detailed where you see all the different outcomes that were studied in the respective randomized clinical trials um, for the particular CP type in severity. So for instance, if I'm interested to see how this program was um, effective, whether it was effective to improve positioning, I'm able to explore on this particular outcome and it gives me a very short standardized conclusion that as a clinician, it will be really easy for me to make my decision whether I would like to implement this in practice or not. There's also possibility to uh, access a more detailed results table where we have a lot more details on the intervention, on the sample that was used in this uh, particular study and on the outcome measures. So overall, I'm happy to report uh, that we have 26 different interventions on the site. Uh, and this information comes from 45 different randomized clinical trials. We've, we have 112 outcome summaries across uh, ADCP, and those relate to 83 different outcomes. So for instance, upper extremity motor function, bimanual function, quality of life, the different feeding and dysphagia outcomes, uh, and sensory. So now off to uh, Jessica to discuss um, the uh, a knowledge translation strategy that was implemented to really improve and optimize the use of evidence-based uh, practices for CP rehabilitation. So thank you, Tatiana, for giving an overview of the intervention section of Edit CP. So to further bridge the research to practice gap, we wanted to design and implement a comprehensive knowledge translation strategy to empower pediatric rehabilitation professionals to use evidence-based interventions for cerebral palsy. So through previous research initiatives, we found that effective knowledge translation strategies should be multifaceted, so including uh, different learning methods, tailored to meet site-specific needs, and lastly, convenient uh, due to a uh, high workloads in participating professionals. Next slide. So we adopted an integrated knowledge translation approach where we collaborated closely with rehabilitation professionals and families engaging in a co-design process. So we implemented this strategy for specifically PTs, OTs, and SLPs um, over 15 weeks across four sites in Montreal and Toronto. So the strategy included two key components. First was the Edit CP Early Intervention Toolkit, which was previously shown. And we also created a training program. So this program includes an online course with three modules, um, including text summaries, videos, quizzes, and case studies. We also created a weekly reminders and newsletters, which were sent to participating rehabilitation professionals to prompt them to continue using Edit CP and also let them know once we've updated the toolkit. 
And then lastly, we trained and had site champions to empower participating, participating professionals at each site to use Edit CP and also answering any site specific questions. So next slide. So this is just a quick video about what the online course looked like. Uh, you can see we have the course outline. Um, it shows that there's only 30 minutes of video content, so it's very quick to do. So let's pretend like I'm a rehabilitation professional and I want to start the course. I'm first brought to the welcome page, which is a brief overview about the purpose of the workshop and this project. Um, we're then brought to module one, which presents an overview of the edit CP toolkit um, and how to interpret a research evidence. Um, you can see in the first video, um, there is a quick introduction video and um, a parent testimonial, which is really showing the importance of evidence-based practices. And after each module, we have a quick quiz, which was just to ensure that professionals were watching the videos and to test their knowledge. So module two and module three presented two different case studies of how you would use the edit CP toolkit to to facilitate your practice and clinical reasoning. So a very quick overview of what the course looked like. Um, next slide, please. So post implementation of this knowledge translation strategy over uh, 15 weeks at these sites, we wanted to evaluate the impact. So we used questionnaires and focus groups for rehabilitation professionals and champions. So our assessments revealed uh, an increase in evidence-based practice activities among participating rehabilitation professionals, suggesting that more professionals were incorporating evidence-based approaches post-strategy. However, we found a non-significant impact on evidence-based attitudes and confidence. So this may suggest potential gaps in addressing underlying beliefs and perceptions surrounding evidence-based practices, and possible considerations may also include the short duration of this implementation project. But we did note a significant improvement in perceived resources, indicating a positive shift in available resources facilitated by this strategy. Feedback from participants also indicated high acceptability and feasibility of our strategy, where prof professionals found Edit CP to be applicable to their practice. However, there were moderate intentions to continue using Edit CP, which needs further exploration and potential, potential enhancements of the toolkit. So despite these positive outcomes, uh, focus groups with champions revealed that there are organizational and systemic challenges which may impact the sustainability and uptake of knowledge translation strategies like this one, such as lack of, lack of established systems and dedicated funding within organizations to support evidence-based practice initiatives fully. So our next steps would be to address these challenges, which is crucial for long-term success. Thank you so much, Jessica. So to finish off, we would like to show you um, a video about ADCP. So it presents um, a story about two babies uh, and how the use of the ADCP uh, toolkit was useful for both families. Early detection and intervention for young children with cerebral palsy, CP, are pivotal for enhancing the child's development and overall well-being. The Edit CP Early Detection and Intervention Tools for Cerebral Palsy was developed to address delays in CP detection and promote the use of evidence-based tailored rehabilitation. What is the impact of Edit CP? Here's a story about two families and their newborns. In the heart of a bustling city, two families welcomed their newborns into the world on the same day, each with hopes and dreams for their precious bundles of joy. In one corner of the city, little Emma came into the world. Born prematurely, Emma faced a higher probability of CP due to several complications during pregnancy, delivery, and in the postnatal period. Her parents, Sarah and Michael, held their breath as they awaited news from the doctors. When they learned of Emma's elevated chance of developing CP, fear gripped their hearts, but they were determined to do everything in their power to help their daughter. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, baby Liam was born to Hannah and David. Liam entered the world full term and healthy, without any apparent complications. His parents were overjoyed at his arrival, their hearts filled with love and excitement for the journey ahead. 
As weeks and months passed, both families embarked on their unique life paths. For Emma, this meant regular visits to the pediatrician and neonatal follow-up team of professionals who closely monitored her development for signs of CP and other developmental issues. The healthcare team used the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination when Emma was six months old and diagnosed CP spastic hemiplegia. Right away, the family was referred to a team of specialists who provided the early intervention therapies to help mitigate the effects of her CP. In particular, the rehabilitation specialist used an effective intervention called Baby Constraint Induced Movement Therapy, or Baby CIMT. As Liam grew older, Hannah and David noticed that he was struggling to reach his developmental milestones. While other children his age were sitting upright and exploring their surroundings, Liam seemed to lag behind. Concerned, Hannah and David sought the advice of their family doctor who, with the use of edit CP, atypical signs, prompts for referral, decided to refer the family for a CP diagnosis to a local specialist. For example, a child neurologist or developmental pediatrician, and at the same time, referred Liam to early intervention therapy. Liam was eventually diagnosed with CP spastic diplegia at 10 months of age. With the diagnosis came a flood of emotions. Hannah and David were worried about Liam's future and the challenges he might face. But amidst the uncertainty, they were determined to do everything in their power to help him thrive and embarked on an early interventions journey. Their rehabilitation specialists, including a physical and an occupational therapist, relied on the Edit CP Toolkit to select the best treatment approaches for Liam's motor and feeding challenges. Hannah and David were also learning about the intervention strategies using the parent-family section of the Edit CP. As the months passed, both Emma and Liam made remarkable progress with the support of their families and healthcare teams. Despite the differences in their initial presentations, with Emma born prematurely and therefore having a higher probability of developing CP, and Liam not having any identified CP etiologic risk, both families shared a common goal, to become experts in their child and give their children the best possible start in life. Through their unwavering commitment and dedication, Emma and Liam flourished, defying the odds and reaching new milestones with each passing day. Today, Emma and Liam are happy, thriving young children who refuse to let their CP define them. With the love and support of their families and the guidance of their dedicated clinical teams, they continue to defy the odds, reminding us all of the power of early detection and intervention in giving every child the chance to shine. Edit CP is meant to assist the primary care physicians in optimizing early detection referral of infants with CP as part of well baby care checkups neonatal follow-up teams in using the HIND for early detection of CP in infants with high probability of CP, rehabilitation specialists in the use of evidence-based therapeutic interventions that are ideal for the child's type and severity of CP. This includes the use of baby CIMT for infants with hemiplegia, caregivers and other family members in understanding CP red flags and existing intervention approaches for their child. Learn more about Edit CP here. Right. Um, so this is the end uh, of our presentation, and we would like to thank you for your attention, for taking the time to join this webinar. You can use the QR code to find out more. And we would like to acknowledge, of course, all of our supporters, especially the Kids Brain and Health Network, uh, for funding um, all of the majority of the studies that are part of this project. Thank you so much. And we're open for questions and a discussion. Thank you so much. That was a lovely video at the end. Um, and thanks for the uh, important information you share. We've gotten a number of comments from um, folks in the audience who um, had never heard of um, this toolkit and are delighted to know of its um, existence here. Um, I've got a few questions. Uh, Corinne asks, 
does the hind have to be administered by a physician or could a physiotherapist do that? Um, Darcy answered uh, live um, to uh, Karen, but I wonder if Darcy, you're able to share your answer for the rest of the group. Absolutely. Uh, so the beauty of the hind is that it can be used by many different clinicians as long as they're trained. So um, it can be physiotherapists, occupational therapists, nurse practitioners, physicians. And uh, we've really targeted the neonatal follow-up teams uh, because they are really doing so many standardized assessments of children who have a higher probability of cerebral palsy. It's a, it's a great tool and even um, newer clinicians can learn to use it reliably. Uh, Dr. Failings, uh, Kathleen has a question. How, could you speak to how the HIND compares to other early detection tools such as general movements assessment? Yes, absolutely. So for those of you who are familiar with the International Clinical Practice Guideline that came out in JAMA PEDS in 2017, there's three key tools in that um, guideline. One is the HIND. One is general movements, and the other is MRI imaging. And the three really work together very nicely. Um, one of the advantages of the hind over the MRI and the general movements is it really can be applied across all settings. So um, when we're looking at uh, um, low um, income countries, they can institute the HINE in their program versus the general movements and the MRI can be a little bit more challenging to introduce in a low or middle income country. Um, but they really are complementary to one another. So the general movements we do when the children are early uh, up to 16 weeks, the HINE starts at three months and goes to 24 months. And the MRI, it can be done at various times, but often without sedation in uh, children when they're um, still in the perinatal unit. So they really work together. They provide complementary information. Thank you so much. Um, Abby asks, are CIMT and biomanual training usually paired when implementing? And can either therapy be beneficial when used on its own? Uh, that's a great question. Thanks, Abby, for that question. So if you are interested in more of the evidence, you can take a look at that um, research article for Novak. But we, we do know that there is strong evidence for each intervention. So for baby CIMT or for baby by manual therapy. I think the longer answer is um, it depends on what the goals are from the parents. Are the parents looking to develop more unilateral skills or does the baby already have some unilateral skills and the goals of the parents are more by manual? So that might help inform kind of which treatment you might go down. Um, often what I find is that I pair the both because um, at the beginning, I'm trying to really stimulate the arm, increase some awareness, some motor control in that arm. And then eventually the parent schools then turn to become very bimanual. So I do do a hybrid of both. Uh, we know certainly for older children, um, a hybrid of CIMT and bimanual therapy uh, give the um, bigger bang for the buck. So it really depends on what your goals are. But yes, the short answer is there is evidence for both. Thank you. So can, I, can I just add to that? Absolutely. I agree with everything that Sophie said. I'll just also make a comment that there is a large randomized controlled trial that Roz Boyd has led uh, in Australia that will be coming out to publication, but they have presented some of the results. And they ra randomized young children under 12 months of age to either baby CMT or the bimanual therapy. And they found that both treatments were equivalent. There wasn't a difference. Both groups improved. Um, but the one point that I really want to highlight is they did, they looked at um, what predicted the best responders, and it was age of referral. So if the child was connected before seven months of age, the child had a greater chance of responding well to the therapy. So it really just speaks to the importance of this early detection linking to early intervention. Thanks. 
Uh, Michelle made a lovely comment. She's um, delighted with the collective work on developing a toolkit with practical resources for a variety of different uh, folks. Um, she's got two questions. One, would you like um, oh, would you like to add the website link to the Buds and Bloom resource page? Um, I'll leave you folks to connect on that. And uh, in the as effective or more effective ratings, please explain what you compared to. For example, more effective than what? Great question, Michelle. I'm really happy to see you here. So uh, it does explain it in the little introduction we have on top of all of the interventions. We selected only randomized clinical trials for those modules. Uh, so they they all come with a comparison intervention. And oftentimes it's usual care. And the comparison intervention is clearly described in every summary uh, that, that is linked to the outcomes that are listed and also in the results table. So a clinician could quickly check uh, what was the comparison intervention in each particular case. Thank you. Um, Afia asks, uh, can we get the link to the courses, please? So I'll ask somebody to either send it to us or um, um, include it into uh, the chat for everyone. Uh, Karen asks, uh, it appears much of, your early, of the early intervention focuses on upper extremity rehab. What evidence or resources are available for early intervention for the lower extremities? So I just scanned quickly through the um, early intervention part of the toolkit. And um, so you can look at some of the different treatments that are more effective. So like, for example, conductive education, where um, the GMFM 68 gross motor function measure was used and showed um, benefit. So that's a more gen general f a measure of motor function, not specific to the upper extremity. Similarly, the game or goals activity motor enrichment program, uh, which involves parent coaching, also shows uh, benefit to gross motor function more generally, similarly to hypotherapy. So using the toolkit, you can look at the different, like opening up to a clinician, you'll see what is more effective and what are the outcome measures? Some relate to you know, other aspects beyond motor function. So depending on what your interest is and the outcome measures of interest, you can uh, the tools can help you to find um, which is more effective if it's specific to gross motor function or um, other, fun other functional aspects of the child or family. Maybe. Oh, go ahead, Jessica. Kind of add quickly. Um, so we also just um, conducted a pre-post implementation study of the, the early intervention toolkit. And one of the things we evaluated was appropriateness. And we did get some feedback about specific content in the tool get, toolkit. So we're looking to see uh, what was missing and how we can integrate feedback. So uh, yeah, we appreciate the point about um, maybe looking and seeing if there's more uh, lower extremity interventions that we could include in the edit CP toolkit. And also about the question about a link to the training resource. Um, we're currently trying to understand what the next steps are for sustainability. Um, LMS platforms are not often available like at that large scale to make it publicly available to everyone. There is a restricted number of participants who can actively use the learning content. Um, so we're so we're looking at maybe making those modules as videos that are publicly available, but then um, we wouldn't have that, um, the quiz functions and summaries as well. So we're kind of in the next, looking at the next steps and how we can provide this training opportunity um, across Canada. Or, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, that's the end of our time together today. And I wanna thank all our speakers for sharing your time and expertise and our audience members for joining us today. I hope you depart with something practical to bring back to your home or your organization. If you do, uh, let us know. We'd love to hear how you use the information. Um, in the uh, weeks and months to come, we'll be hosting uh, the following uh, offerings and uh, tune in or subscribe to our newsletter for um, updates to this list. Uh, in case you missed it, on May 6th, we released a new report entitled Beyond Band-Aids, Delivering a Future Fit for Kids. The report is based on broad uh, range consultation um, with um, across sector, family and youth partners as well. 
um, presents concrete recommendations and calls to action to right-size health systems for children and youth. Um, and you can take a peek at the report. Uh, Logan's going to uh, drop the link to it in the chat. Um, as part of the kickoff of that Beyond Band-Aids campaign, we hosted Julia Hengensberg and Dr. Catherine Spart on a podcast entitled Beyond Band-Aids, Collective Action to Right-Size Children's Healthcare Systems. Tune in on your preferred platform to give it a listen. In late June, we'll be releasing our next uh, Right Sizing podcast episode in conversation with Dr. Lee Chapman and Rebecca Earle related to right sizing and the nursing workforce. More details to come uh, towards the end of the month. Um, and finally, save the date for Children's Healthcare Canada's 2024 annual conference. We're headed to St. John's, Newfoundland on October 20th to 22nd. And it'll be co-hosted, we're co-hosting it with our uh, members from the Janeway Children's Hospital Foundation. We've also launched the call for nominations for our revamped uh, awards, leadership awards program, the Children's Healthcare Canada Innovation and Impact Awards, as they're now called. The call for nomination will remain open until June 30th. Um, nominate your favorite folks. Um, it's always great if you watch live as your questions and comments really enrich the discussion. But if you can't, the recordings of these sessions are made available after the fact on our website. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks to our wonderful speakers for this presentation and for your audience engagement. And hopefully we'll see many of you back here soon. Bye everyone.